Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to University of Central Asia's online public lecture. My name is Shaukat Ali Khan, and I am the Chief Information Officer here at the University of Central Asia. Our today's topic is people-centric cybersecurity. What does it mean, and what are the lessons learned from COVID-19? And I am really happy that our today's speaker is Dr. Jessica Barker, a global expert in this domain. Dr. Jessica Barker is a leader in the human side of cybersecurity. She has been named one of the top 20 most influential women in cybersecurity in the United Kingdom and was awarded as one of the UK's Tech Women 50. She is co founder and co CEO of Sigenta, where she follows her passion of positively influencing cybersecurity awareness, behaviors, and culture in organizations around the world. She is a popular keynote speaker, regularly shares her experience in the media, and she is the chair of Club Cisco. In 2020, she keynoted RSA San Francisco and is due to have two books published. Please welcome Dr. Jessica Barker. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Jessica. <laughs> I'm just testing you all. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate the warm welcome and I'm absolutely delighted to be delivering this lecture uh, for you all today. I hope you'll enjoy it and I hope you'll all take something from it. So what I'm going to do is just share my screen with you all um, so that you can see some slides that I have prepared um, to run us through the next sort of 30 minutes or so. Um, and I would be very delighted to take questions um, at the end. So please do be sharing your questions um, in chat and we'll try and get through as many as possible when we get to the end of the presentation. So you've already heard a, um, a very kind and warm introduction. Um, so I won't spend too long letting you know more about who I am. Um, but I've been in cybersecurity for nearly 10 years and I've always focused very much on the human side. So. There's lots of different ways to interpret and to understand the human side of cybersecurity because cybersecurity, we always think about it being about technology. But of course, if you think about every stage of the technology life cycle, whether that is design, whether that is development, whether that is testing, use, abuse, destruction, every part of our um, engagement with technology includes people and people are very important to that. My work in cybersecurity on the human side is very focused on raising awareness of cybersecurity in usually large organizations. It is focused on positively influencing people's behaviors and looking at the cybersecurity culture of organizations. We'll come to some of this as we move on. I do lots of other things in the community. Um, so you'll have heard I'm a chair of Club CISO. At Club CISO, it's all about looking at how we can give CISOs, give information security leaders a voice. And I also do lots of outreach with young people. And I've done some volunteer work um, in the UK and around Europe to raise awareness of cybersecurity in hospitals in response to COVID-19. So today, what I'm going to be covering is what the human side of cybersecurity is, why awareness, behavior, and culture are so important to cybersecurity. I'm going to look at some of the lessons that we're learning from COVID-19, and I'm gonna do that in a, a couple of ways. And I'm going to end um, by leaving you with some thoughts on what you can do to better understand people-centric cybersecurity. And I'm also gonna give just a few recommendations of ideas, things you may want to read or follow up on if you're interested in learning more. So, as I said before, when we think about cybersecurity, we often think, of course, about technology because technology is absolutely fundamental and central to cybersecurity. But cybersecurity doesn't stop at technology. People are absolutely inherent in every part of of cybersecurity. So whether we're thinking about the technology that's being designed, that's being used, whether we're thinking about the people who are maliciously trying to hack companies, their motivations, their methods, whether we're thinking about people within organizations who 
don't want to cause a problem or an incident, um, but they maybe do because the system isn't well designed, because they haven't been trained, because they haven't got the tools or the time or the capacity um, to engage in secure behaviors. There's all sorts of ways that we can look at cybersecurity from the human perspective. I talked about my role as chair of Club CISO. Club CISO, every year for the last seven years, we have run a survey of our membership to ask them all sorts of questions about cybersecurity. Our members are all information security leaders. They are generally either the CISO or the equivalent CISO, so Chief Information Security Officer or equivalent in their organization. And we ask them all sorts of questions about their experiences of security um, and security from the perspective of their organization. We take the results anonymously and then we produce a report and what I'm showing you here is one of the findings from that report this year, where we asked the CISOs what activity had led to a material cybersecurity incident. By that we mean an incident that really had an impact, not something small, uh, but something that actually affected the organisation. What led to it? What was the cause of it? And this year in 2020, just the same as in 2019, we found that the two most common causes were malicious outsider, a cyber criminal, and non-malicious insider. So when we talk about the human side of cybersecurity, a lot of people will think automatically of a malicious insider, of somebody in the organization who is stealing information um, consciously and is causing a data breach on purpose. Those incidents happen. The malicious insiders are a real thing and they can cause real harm, um, but they are much less common than somebody inside an organization making a mistake. As I said before, it can be because the system hasn't been well designed. It can be because they haven't had training. It can be because they're overworked and they just actually have too much to deal with. But for various different reasons, we see the non-malicious insider activities being a very real problem. What interests me in particular about this graph, about this data, is to think about the relationship between malicious outsiders and non-malicious insiders. I believe that these two statistics are highly related because when I think about the clients that we work with and their experiences in terms of cyber incidents in the last few years, the biggest cause for them, the biggest threat that they face in terms of cybersecurity is social engineering this idea of a wolf in sheep's clothing. So an attacker that is disguising their activity. By social engineering, I mean um, the manipulation of people by outsiders to give information, access to information, money, access to money. They're being manipulated into doing something they wouldn't ordinarily do, being scammed and duped. And to give you an example, this is um, an email that went to one of our clients and it looked like it came from the CEO. It went to somebody in the finance department and obviously I've changed the details so you can't see you know, which organization it went to. I've not included anybody's names, but the text I have retained and I've just added some highlights in red that show some of the psychological triggers that were used by the attacker to make the target more likely to do what they were asking, which is transfer money. So this went to somebody in the finance department of this organization that went on to become one of our clients. And the email, as you can see, it says, oh, I need your help with something. It's really sensitive. It's extremely confidential. This must happen really quickly. I need you to transfer this large sum of money um, because we are acquiring a business and nobody else must know about it. I'm trusting you and you alone. I know I can rely on you. This is really important. So there, there are lots of triggers being used to manipulate the individual that received this email. They're being put under a time pressure. They're being flattered. They're under the pressure of authority because they believe this email has come from the CEO. And they're being made to feel that they are special. They're being trusted with something. So this is all very influential on the person. They receive this email, they immediately transfer the money. And then after they have transferred the money, they think, that was a little bit strange. <laughs> I've never been asked to do that before. Uh, maybe I should just check. 
So they pick up the phone, they call the CEO's office. Of course, it was not a legitimate email. The CEO and everybody in the office of the CEO did not know anything about it. It was a scam email. And by the time this was all discovered, the money was gone and it was too late to get it back. So I hear this kind of tale very often. What interests me about this is that this individual receives the email, they process the money, they don't think about it. As soon as the damage is done, they realize this person is the same person. They've had no extra training. They've been made no more aware within those split seconds. So what happens? How come they don't realize before they make the transfer, but they do afterwards? For me, I think we can get our answer from behavioral economics. And here I'm drawing on um, the work that you'll see in the books Nudge and in Thinking Fast and Slow, where they talk about two ways of thinking, the fast way and the slow way, or system one and system two. The fact that we all as human beings have two ways of processing information in our brains. On the one hand, we're very rational and we can process information slowly. We think about unintended consequences. If you try to manipulate somebody while they're processing information in that slow way, you're going to be much less successful. We're much harder to manipulate when we're processing information with this Spock part of our brain. However, if somebody is thinking in the fast part of their brain or with the fast processes of their brain, then we're actually much easier to manipulate. If we're thinking fast, then we don't take time to think about unintended consequences. We don't think um, that actually things might not be as they seem. We tend to be more emotional and more imp impulsive and we just react. And so according to behavioral economics, there's different triggers that can be used to push us into processing information in this fast way. And I think this is what's happening with those kinds of phishing emails, messages, phone calls. Tr different triggers are used to encourage us to think fast, to respond emotionally without thinking about possible unintended consequences. And then once those pressures are gone, that's why we then realize maybe we were scammed because we're no longer thinking fast, we revert back to thinking slow. So some of these common triggers we have seen being used, unfortunately, to take advantage of the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic. So for example, there have been lots of emails that have been shared by cyber criminals, phishing emails that look like they come from the World Health Organization. They are a cry for help saying, we need your support, we need your donations, please give money. Of course, these don't come from the World Health Organization, but they're made to look fairly legitimate. They, of course, use the branding. You know, they talk about the fact that we need to accelerate efforts to develop vaccines, tests and treatments. So they put us under emotional pressure to click the link, transfer money. We've seen other emails that come in looking like they come from um, you know, legitimate authorities. So this one, for example, that has been very prevalent in the UK, looking like it comes from the government um, saying we need to, um, we need to give you a tax refund. And because many people are worried about finances in response to maybe being furloughed or losing their job, economic uncertainty, we are more at risk of clicking a link like this in a message, which is you know, branded, looks legitimate, uses the right terminology, but of course is being sent from scammers. We've seen other ones around the world. So this one um, came um, to citizens in Canada. This was actually a text message because of course these messages don't just come via email. This was a text message saying, um, we're providing free masks. Again, people worried about what they can do to uh, mitigate the risk of COVID-19, people trying to get hold of masks. Here's a text message coming in saying, you just need to click here and you can get a free surgical mask. So it's taking advantage of people's fear around the COVID-19 pandemic to try and encourage them to click on a link that is, of course, unfortunately, a phishing message. So all of these triggers, this taking advantage of our emotion, is a way to get us to think fast and to not interrogate the information that's presented in front of us. 
And I want to try and play you a video now. I'm hoping this is going to work um, over Zoom. This is a video that we created as part of the CV19 group. I'm going to see if it will play and I'm going to talk it through because there's no audio. We wanted this to be very accessible on social media. This is aimed at people who are working in healthcare. And we wanted to help people to, to be aware if they're healthcare workers that they're going to be targeted, unfortunately, um, by scammers. So we created this, um, these resources, lots of phishing resources, and we've sent these around hospitals and other healthcare providers. And what we really wanted to show is how the attackers try to lure us in try to um, make us feel tempted by something, feel curious about something, encourage us to click a link. What we really wanted to convey in this message was not anything that was fear mongering. With my work in cybersecurity and the work we do at uh, the company that I run with my husband, Sygenta, we really focus on empowering people, on being positive. And I'm gonna talk about why that is as we move through this presentation. So I said there, we, we really didn't want to be fear mongering. We've seen in cybersecurity that people actually will try to use fear. They will try to use the cybersecurity threat um, to prompt people to engage more and to have the right cybersecurity behaviors. And some people think that's a good idea because they think, well, if it works in social engineering, if the cyber criminals can send a message to make me feel scared about COVID-19 and that's going to make me more likely to click the link, then can't we do the same? Can't we use fear to actually try to drive people to behave in a positive security way? But unfortunately, it's not that simple. Research has shown that actually if you want to influence a short term behavior, a knee jerk reaction, then actually fear can be really powerful. The, the, as I said before, behavioral economics shows we can use fear to make people react. But if you want to try and change behaviors long term, then fear is not effective. Um, it actually means that people just don't process information in that way. When we're trying to get people to make a proactive long-term change, fear actually doesn't work. If we use fear to try and drive um, cybersecurity messages, then lots of research in psychology over the last few decades shows us that actually people won't react in the way that we want. People are more likely to switch off from our messaging. They're more likely to ignore us. They're more likely to feel tired by what we're saying. They're less likely to engage. And this is quoting uh, one of the authors that I mentioned earlier um, in relation to the nudge book, people show a disproportionate fear of risks that seem unfamiliar and hard to control. So people are already scared when it comes to cybersecurity. And if our messaging adds more fear on top of that, then we're actually going to drive them away. So unfamiliar and out of control. This for me very much describes how a lot of people feel about cybersecurity. And this is partly because we've seen a huge growth in data breaches over the last, I would say, sort of five to 10 years. If you're not familiar with the website, Information is Beautiful, I highly recommend that you take a look. It presents information in a very accessible, very engaging, visually engaging way. And some of that information is in relation to data breaches. And it shows how many data breaches there have been and it gives you information, some of the high level information on those breaches. And actually, you will see when you go to this site, if you look at the most recent data breaches, as you can see from this slide, the page is full. There's very little white space. There's all of these bubbles showing the different breaches. When you scroll down and you go back maybe five years or so, the page becomes much more clear. There's much less breaches happening and certainly less hitting the news. The fact that we hear about data breaches on an almost daily basis can be beneficial when it comes to raising awareness. It means that people are aware of cybersecurity, but it can also make them feel fatigue. It can make them feel tired. It can make them feel overwhelmed and it can make them feel resigned to the fact that these breaches are happening anyway. What can I do about it? So we really need to recognize that as a blocker and understand how we can engage given those circumstances. 
I mentioned fatigue, and I can't talk about the human side of cybersecurity and not talk about passwords. Uh, passwords, I think it was 15 years or so that Bill Gates said that the password was soon going to expire. And here we are, 15 years or so later, and still, of course, we rely very heavily on passwords. Um, so unfortunately, that prediction was not correct. Passwords are a real challenge when it comes to the human side of cybersecurity because we ask people to have a different, unique, complicated, random password for each of their accounts. And we know, according to research, that people have at least 30 different online accounts, I would say more like in the hundreds. And if we don't help people to manage those passwords, then it becomes a very heavy burden on them. So at Sygenta, we, um, like many security companies, we collect data breaches of passwords to perform analysis on. We keep them and we obviously strip them of, of personal data, um, but we see what are the trends when it comes to passwords and how can we use some of this information to help raise awareness actually around better use of passwords. So we have many databases, large databases of real world passwords. And this is showing a few bits of information from one in which we hold 1.2 billion passwords. And we look at things like, okay, who's using a band name for a password? And we found one of the most common passwords in there was Eminem, just the word Eminem. And we can see that's been found in our database over 170,000 times. Metallica, quite close behind Eminem, we can see that's been used almost 150,000 times. This is not using special characters. This isn't Metallica with a one, which will be in there many times, or Eminem with threes, which will be in there very many times. This is just the plain words. So we know that people are using still, of course, very basic, memorable passwords, and they're breached. People are often told use a long password that a password, if it's long, then it's strong. But of course, what we need to convey to people is that that doesn't explain everything. If you're using a known word, if you're using a, a, a phrase or a word that is in the dictionary or that is in common usage in any way, then of course cyber criminals will have this in their password cracking dictionaries and your password will be breached. So the longest real word password that we found in our database is the Spanish for supercalifragilisticexpialidosa. So somebody probably thinks they've got a great, clever, long password, but it's known. It's a known word. So of course it's cracked in the breach and it's cracked in our database. When I talk about passwords, I never want to blame or shame people for using these simple ones, because unless we give people the tools, um, then we're asking for the impossible when we tell people to use random, unique passwords. I believe the only way that people can do it is if they use a password manager or if they write their passwords down. So I'm a big advocate of password managers for home use. I will actually encourage people if they don't want to use a password manager to write their passwords down. I would never encourage it for an office situation, but if you're keeping your passwords at home, and crucially, you aren't under threat, you trust the people that you live with in your house, then I think it's much safer to keep a book, say, of written passwords, keep it in a locked drawer or a safe if you can, but that's far less likely to be broken into and stolen by a criminal in the real world than um, if you use non-unique, weak passwords like the ones you see on the screen, if you're using those for your accounts, then they will be breached over the internet. So it's all about helping people. It's all about empowering people. It's all about giving them the tools and the guidance and making security easier for them. So as you can see, my approach is about being positive. It is about um, understanding that people are more drawn to a positive net message than a negative message. And we know this, for example, from um, studies in healthcare. There's one study in healthcare in New York hospitals where doctors and nurses were found not to be sanitizing their hands enough. 
So um, researchers were trying to change their behaviours and they tried to do this at first by scaring the doctors and nurses, by making them feel under surveillance, by saying, we're putting cameras up, we're watching you to make sure that you wash and sanitise your hands, so you need to do it. And the researchers thought that this would work. They thought that if they actually made people feel under that kind of negative pressure, that it would help. And of course it didn't. So they realized they had to try something new. And what they then did was put up um, electronic screens above every hand washing and hand sanitization stand. And when somebody used it, the screen popped up with a smiley face and a message saying something like, great job. And then each shift um, was compared against each other on a big screen in the staff area, kind of gamification, the idea that if we can make this fun, if we can make it a competition between the different shifts, maybe this will influence behavior. And the researchers didn't actually expect this to really work. They just didn't know what else to try. But what they found is that it increased rates of hand sanitization by over 90%. And this has been explained by the fact that when we get positive reinforcement, when we are told, great job, well done, keep doing that, it actually triggers a hit of dopamine in our brain. We feel physically rewarded for having done that good thing and being complimented, being positively encouraged by it. So we want to keep doing it. It drives more of that behavior. And we don't have the same biological response to a negative message. It doesn't influence us, so we don't, we don't want to avoid it in future. And this for me was evidently an approach that I felt was taken by the UK in response to COVID-19. Of course, COVID-19 um, can be compared in a way to cyber insecurity, a threat that we can't see, that a lot of us don't understand, um, but that we're told, you know, is obviously with COVID-19, an absolutely very real threat, a threat on people's lives. In cybersecurity, we're trying to convey this. Of course, it's a very important threat. It threatens people's livelihood. Um, and sometimes it can have physical consequences in terms of um, people's physical safety. So I see parallels between the two. And with COVID-19, was, it was very important that people in authority tried to encourage people to change their behaviors, to practice um, hand washing, social distancing, to stay at home for certain periods of time. And I thought it was really interesting to watch how the UK tried to do this. The Queen, there was a message from the Queen um, after some time of lockdown in the UK. And for me, it was a masterclass in positive reinforcement. Um, the Queen spoke about how proud she was of the country, about the fact that she thought the country would be proud of itself for adhering to lockdown and for following these behaviours. She didn't tell people off for not sticking to them. She focused very much on, you've been doing the right thing by staying home, keep doing it. I thought it was very clever and very well done. Another example we can look at in terms of COVID-19 and some of the communications to change behaviours is what we had in the UK a few weeks ago when the key advisor for our Prime Minister was exposed for allegedly breaking lockdown rules. He, his wife was unwell, um, she was showing symptoms of COVID-19, but he still went into work, even though official guidance at the time seemed to say, if anyone in your house is unwell, showing symptoms, do not go into work, do not leave the house. They traveled the length of the country because they were worried about childcare when they were both unwell. Again, many people in the UK felt that guidance said, you should not do that. So there was a big outcry in the UK, and um, people in authority have said, no, actually, he didn't break the rules. A lot of the population and a lot of the media disagree. So now we have a situation where how we're supposed to act in response to this unseen threat is not perceived to be being led by the top. It's very important when we're trying to engage with behavioral change that behaviors are led by the top. Because if people don't feel that those in authority are acting in the way that they recommend, then nobody will follow the rules or lots of people will break the rules because they'll think, well, it's one rule for them. 
it can't be a different rule for me. And for me, this partly comes back to social proof, social influence theory. The fact that if we don't know how to behave in a certain situation as human beings, we will look to how others behave. We will model their behavior. And it's been found with social proof that we will look at um, how the majority behaves. So it was a study, I believe, by the University of Pennsylvania that looked at when we're influenced by social proof and found that it takes a, a large proportion of a group to start acting in a certain way and the rest will follow. But we're also influenced by people in authority. We're also influenced by people that we relate to or people that we think are leaders. Those people have a more heavy weight when it comes to influencing behaviors. And so when it comes to cybersecurity, we look at the people in leadership in our organizations. We also look at our colleagues. We look at people that we admire in our organizations and we think, how are they behaving? How are they managing their passwords? Are they using two-factor authentication? Do they hold the door open for people that aren't wearing an ID badge? All these little behaviors, we look to others and we copy what they do in all areas of life, including in cybersecurity. So I've talked about awareness. I've talked about behavior. One thing I just really want to touch on is the fact that we must be aware with the human side of cybersecurity, it's not just about raising awareness. We can raise awareness of something. As I said earlier, awareness of cybersecurity is quite high. That doesn't mean people will behave in the ways that we want. We have to think about how usable security is, whether people can actually engage in security. And we have to make it more frictionless, easier for people to engage in. I think it's interesting to draw parallels. So I've drawn, drawn, par drawn parallels with um, healthcare. I've drawn parallels with the situation we find ourselves in with COVID-19. And I want to draw another parallel in terms of cybersecurity and the aviation industry. Because when we look at aviation, we can see how they manage incidents. And we can see that since about the 1950s, there has been a very large decline in incidents in aviation. And this has been attributed partly to technology, the introduction of the jet engine, but also very heavily to human factors. It was around that time that in aviation, they started to look much more at human machine interaction. How do people engage with technology? How do our pilots um, you know, interact with the buttons and the controls that they see in front of them? And are we making those controls intuitive? So they didn't just look at what was technically right. They looked at how people reacted and how to make um, safety on an airplane more usable. They also introduced what's known as a just culture, a culture where when there is an incident, it's not about looking for blame. It's not about seeing who can be, um, you know, who the, the finger can be pointed at and who can be held responsible. Instead, it's about really understanding what went wrong. And there's a very important difference in that approach, because when you make it about just understanding what went wrong, people are more likely to be open about things that have happened. They're more likely um, to, to say if they did something wrong, because they don't feel that they will be held as the scapegoat or they will be um, you know, un unnecessarily punished. They understand that this is for the greater good. They need to explain what happened so that it doesn't happen again. In cybersecurity, I think this is so important because if we build a security where people are afraid to put their hands up and say when they have clicked a link in a phishing email or where they've emailed the wrong person some information or where they've left some important papers somewhere and they can't find them anymore. If people are afraid to say when something like this has happened, then they just won't say it. It doesn't mean that we will have less incidents. It just means that those incidents will be hidden. And when it comes to security, we need to know about incidents as soon as possible so that we can investigate and mitigate any further damage. And this is why culture 
is absolutely at the heart of cybersecurity because a lot of it is about what are the values, what are the norms, how are we making people feel, and are we setting a culture where people will be open and honest and tell us when there's been an incident, or are we making people afraid? Are we making them afraid to ask questions? Are we making them afraid to say when they don't understand something? Are we making them afraid to say when something has gone wrong and they may have been the cause of an incident? Culture is hugely important. Listening to people in security is really important because people and culture are at the heart. And something else that I think is very important in security and in security from an organizational point of view is talking about personal security. One of the big advantages we have in cybersecurity is that this touches on people's lives in all sorts of different ways. So if we are working with an organization and we're trying to make the people in that organization more aware of security, one thing we can do is talk about security at home because most people care about their own personal security. They care about making sure their credit cards are safe and they're using social media in a safe way. And people care about the security of their children or their parents, their neighbors. So actually there's lots of ways we can engage with people. And at Sygenta, we do an awful lot of outreach to try to spread security messages to lots of different groups. And so we provided this security, personal security top tips. And um, particularly we thought it was important at the moment when people are actually engaging and relying on technology more than ever. So drawing this to a close, I just want to leave you with some of the key messages um, from my presentation today. One thing to remember when it comes to cybersecurity, whichever stage of the technology lifecycle you're looking at, people are there, people will be central. Social engineering, one of the biggest threats that we are currently facing in cybersecurity and that we've been facing for the last few years. And this exploits us thinking fast. Fear can motivate short term behavior, which is why, unfortunately, it's often very effective when it comes to social engineering, but it's not effective for long term behavioral change. It's important that we provide people tools that we engage with positivity and that we lead from the top when we're trying to change behaviors. Recognize that culture is at the heart of security and empower security on the personal level more than ever at the moment. So I've referred to um, a few studies and books and if you'd like the sort of full reading list, I'm very happy to provide that, but just an idea for sort of further reading. And these three books that I recommend are not cybersecurity books. They're all about people, about how people understand messages and behave. And you will read those books. And even though they don't talk about cybersecurity, I think you will see many, many parallels, many messages that are relevant. So if you're not familiar with behavioral economics, um, or if you're not as familiar with neuroscience and psychology, then these are three great books to start with. Um, and um, The Optimism Bias by Tali Sherratt, um, that's actually available as a TED talk. So you can go and watch um, Dr. Sherratt give a great TED talk about the way that we are biased towards being optimistic, because I think that has lots of important messages for cybersecurity. And I have two books myself being published this year. They're not out yet, um, but if you want, you can keep your eyes peeled for those. And if you want any more information, if you want to keep in touch, um, then you can find me um, and the company that I run uh, with my husband, Sygenta. We engage on lots of different platforms. So whichever works for you, I'm sure um, if you want to keep following us, you'll find um, lots of information available on those platforms. Thank you so much for your time and your attention, everyone. And if you have any questions, I'd be delighted to take them now.